Oh, hi guys. I'm going to be talking about FO and Spark and how we use it at ASAP. A quick background about me. My name is Udit. I've been building platforms for uh, ML and AI at ASAP for a while. Uh, and I've been kind of working with Airflow for about four or five years. Previously at Sumo and did my master's from Amherst. Uh, you can also find the talk on Airflow's official blog. We kind of worked with the community to kind of share some of our use cases. So this is going to be the agenda today. If you see, the meat of the talk is going to be towards the end. So some background on ASAP, if folks aren't aware, we've been building AI solutions for contact centers for over a decade. We've done classical ML. We've sort of been through the whole rigmarole of doing classification stuff to now heavily migrating towards LLMs and generative AI. And if you've not been living under a rock, generative AI has been disruptive specifically in the contact center space. We've got AI powered tools, generative agents for contact centers, generative summarization tools for text, generative ASR workflows. And as you can imagine, this requires a lot of ML ops specifically for all the models and all the engineering around it. And we've been a big proponent of Airflow at ASAP. So what does it look like? I think we, I, I tried, this is all in reflection. So I've tried to figure out how, what's the narrative around ops specificity for ASAP. It's, I think these three points, continuous improvement. We're continuously retraining our models, continuously fine tuning them, doing sort of experiments on them, doing multi lora stuff. We're, there's diverse data processing needs. So things like what are our data retention policies? How do we deal with subsampling of production data and dealing with every kind of S data sort of intermediate storage from S3 to Snowflake to Prometheus to other sort of RDS uh, stuff at AWS. And for moving towards sort of a Gen AI stuff, which has constantly been changing at least over the last two years, 18 months, we've had to be sort of flexible, but at the same time, scalable for all the changing technologies. So this is where Airflow comes in. At ASAP, we use Airflow under three umbrellas. I mean, it's obviously not this clear cut, but we try and keep it separate. I'm representing the ML side of things, but I know that we have a very strong data engineering sort of team, which uses Airflow. We use it for ingestion and pre-processing. We're for data ops, we're using data across different customer life cycles, different retention policies different sort of upstream and downstream different workflows for ML, and then for ops. So for development, evaluation, and monitoring of models. A quick OE, I think this was helpful for us to reflect when I was making this, and I feel like folks who are adopting open source kind of usually helps to learn from the community, and I think this is what I want to highlight here. We've been, we were in Airflow world for, I think, P2.0, 1.8, 1.10, and at that point, we were using highly customized Airflow for stability. We had a, our DAG images and our Docker images coupled, so it was kind of super unwieldy. And we had a lot of workflows which we'd written for sort of stabilized stuff. Uh, to stabilize it because it was not sort of production scalable at that point, but it was still useful. When we went up, it was obviously a shock. It was like an upgrade to our operating system. But 2.3x, we really liked it. Everything worked super cleanly out of the box. There was still some custom solutions we had to build, but that was more about the infrastructure we're running out, which is Kubernetes. Another thing which really worked for us, and I wanted to highlight this because I've seen it happen and in online discussions, is Git Sync. Not a lot of people ended up using it, and still I feel like I see some people sort of talking about whether it's helpful or not. For us, it was super helpful. Iterations, iterations improved by about like 100x. We went from builds from like an hour long and two hours long just because of the sheer amount of work we were doing in Airflow to about three minutes, two minutes, or even less. After that, we started building sort of strong ML ops support. We had to add in operations around model lifecycle, training, retrain, fine tuning. How do you allow people to run experiments, sort of evaluations, deployments? At this point, once we realized Airflow was useful, we started supporting different deployments for different sort of teams. You had application specific teams, you had data science specific teams, you had sort of, for our use case, we had, client, we had client success teams as well. And I think the last two are more recent over the last six to eight months where, well, Spark has been around for a while, but Spark integration really helped us sort of take our workflows and scale them out and really sort of 
get the best of both worlds. I will talk about that later. And then batch processing was sort of using Airflow in a customer environment for batch workflows, especially in LLM sort of generative summarization use cases and ASR use cases. So this is sort of what, it's a simple diagram. It, this is what it looks like at ASAP. We are heavy users. We are on EKS in AWS, and we are basically using ECR for our images, Git Sync, GitHub DAG repos, Aurora RDS, and S3 is our sort of great intermediate plane. We are heavy users of Kubernetes executor and Kubernetes pod operators. And we've been sort of, I think all our dads are post 21 are off salary for our scale. So how do we use Airflow at ASAP? For ingestion and pre-processing. So I'm going to run through the three sort of points really quickly because I want to get to the use cases, the use case specifically. So for ingestion, we ingest data through real-time Spark applications, through Golang applications, and Airflow sort of routes them to different storages. It could be S3, it could be Athena, it could be SQL, Redshift, you could think about Prometheus. And those are used either by analytics pipelines further down, or they're used by customer success to sort of run some experiments, solutions engineering, as well as data science workflows. This is something we discovered about eight months ago where using automation, so at enterprise scale, we need different policies for data retention lifecycle for different customers. And Airflow comes in super handy there to sort of automate those pipelines. We can really automate the automatic deletion, a data deletion on certain cadences. We can schedule it. We can make it easier and less sort of error prone as opposed to manual sort of management. And then production data sampling. So running offline evals to periodically collect and process production data, it really sort of helps us here as well, especially, for example, transcribing audio and running our, ES, sort of eva evaluating our ASR pipelines as we develop models. I think with ops, with MLOps, I think this is a fairly sort of standard story, at least based on my talk and the talks I've seen here. Folks use it for automatic training, re-triggering, fine-tuning, connecting sort of modeling pipelines to data, sort of using the really cool scheduling flows. Here, I, I think highlighting the executor and the pod operator, I think having a really strong infra team has helped us use that pattern and be really good at that. We also use it for monitoring and evaluation. So if some models are running in production, we end up subsampling the, some sampling data and then running, getting evals for those things. There are S3 triggers, sensors, which we use API calls which also Airflow slowly has become sort of stable around. And we also have deep integration with our observability tooling. So Prometheus and Grafana are well sort of supported in our workflows through Airflow. And I think everything else I've tried to, I, mean, I know that engineering sort of already involves training and evaluation and monitoring, but I think everything else, which doesn't really fit into those buckets, I've started, I've tried to put it into the engineering bucket, which is, around uh, complex pipelines for one-off use cases, for one-off experimental purposes, POCs. And if your teams, if your application-specific teams are really good at sort of just iterating really quickly, Airflow really helps us here if we have a strong sort of Airflow team to help them out. But with LLM ops, I think what we realized is there's a lot of work we can do and support sort of folks, especially our data science and research teams as well as engineering teams. So popular LLM provider support, if everybody is adding API endpoints to chat completion endpoints, that is super simple to support. Essentially, it's you're running sort of like an on-demand service and you can definitely sort of uh, see that play out very quickly. Uh, support for Bedra, support for OpenAI, Anthropic, internal LLMs, which we're hosting through internal optimized serving technology. Uh, and we also are able to include redaction if you're sending sensitive customer data to these third-party providers. Same thing with monitoring. In the traditional ML, you're evaluating using metrics. Here, you're building LLM as a judge pipelines. So you're asking an LLM hosted somewhere, hey, I ran this, does this look all right to you? It's fairly new asking an LLM to monitor an LLM, but this is sort of in the LLM sort of workflow. This seems to be fairly well adopted across the industry for now. And they, these pipelines really help us for like white-based evals, you know, how things are looking because it's really hard to quantify what's good in generative text and generative audio. On the engineering side, I think 
there's a lot of work we've had to do around prompt management and support. So how do you version prompts? How do you pull the latest prompts? What are you sort of calling against? How do you templatize them? All of those things were really uh, easy to pull and sort of support once we figured out how that worked with Airflow. And again, we were able to support one of workflows here as well. So a, key, a few key learnings before I take up too much time. Airflow doesn't stand alone. Team, what, our team is well versed in infrastructure, in platform, and in ML. And we feel like it has historically sort of been a comprehensive and mature product. And it allows, sort of, it requires that kind of knowledge to take it far. But if you know that, you can really take it far. Like you have a really good developer to sort of workflow creation. Uh, Airflow abstractions are super powerful and I'm really excited for V3 and above. We primarily use Airflow as an orchestrator and really sort of strongly integrated with third-party providers and it allows the, us to scale really well. That said, I think we, we wanted to V2 was a big deal for us. Git Sync really was like a major pain point at that time, like two years ago. I just want to call out again because I feel like people in the open source community on the Slack channel are still sort of wondering if that's helpful or not. And I've seen some workflows which don't use it. And I think another thing which we realized, which I realized when online, which I, when I was online, was not a lot of people, not a lot of teams use the latest versions. But we feel like stability has really improved out of the box out of uh, after 2.3, and we're currently almost upgrading at every opportunity possible. So. I guess I have 10 minutes. Sure, let's rush through this. So I, I wanted to mostly talk about a few case studies and run through an ASR flow and then talk about how we integrated Spark for improving processing time. And then if I get some time towards the end, I'll be able to talk about some quick LLM workflows, which builds on top of us integrating Spark. So I'm not sure if folks are familiar, but an ASR workflow usually would have three major steps where we and the goal of that task would be to transcribe current and historical audio data for downstream pipelines. You could be current, you would be transcribing data for training or updating your models, or you could be evaluating them or historical audio for like collecting customer data where they just dump a bunch of contact center calls and then you're supposed to, you're supposed to build a model for them. A workflow usually consists of pre-processing, transcription, and post-processing. What are you pre-processing? You're pre-processing the audio files, you're doing language identification, you're doing sort of diarization, where you're trying to split out the speaker channels. Transcription is pretty straightforward, but also in post-processing, you're redacting the transcripts. If you're uh, sending it for further downstream, a task like generative text summarization of a call, you're re doing redaction. So those are the three steps. And in fairly sort of a straightforward fashion, you have three steps. In Airflow, each of them is a task. They, we use S3 as our intermediate data plane. Everything which a certain task doesn't need and can be passed down to a future task, we dump it through S3. You can think of this on the order of size of a few hundred gigabytes, audio calls, uh, MP3, H4, or audio files, and each task, again, maps to a KPO. So we need to scale these tasks for different kinds of audio corpora, different kinds of audio input formats, different run times. If you're running it on a standalone model versus VOIP or IVR or something like that, and different output transcript schema as well. Looking at it just a bit more in depth, each single task is using the scheduler executor, which is the KP Kubernetes executor from the scheduler, and then is run in the single task pod. The task pod image comes from an ECR, which is application specific. So hypothetically speaking, if your transcription pipeline is, is C++ PyBind pipeline, you're building that image separately and running that using a KPO. And the data comes in from previous tasks from sort of your data layer, which is a tooling which we built on S3. So why Spark here specifically? I think one reason we thought it was, help, it was going to be helpful is processing capabilities for these kind of workflows kind of dynamically grow. And we had no, at least at that point, about eight to nine months ago, did not have a very stable way of uh, configuring parallel workers. These are embarrassingly parallel tasks. Uh, you can imagine just like, how do you summarize? How do you run transcription on every single audio file which is interdependent, which is independent of another file? So it was hard to do this at scale without sort of involving another thing. And Spark kind of naturally led itself to, lent itself to that paradigm. Spark also has a 
in our experience, a good developmental work experience, development experience. It's data frame centric. You're not sort of running scripts in loops where you're operating on RDDs, data frames, et cetera. And yeah, Spark lent itself to like he offloading heavy data processing to it and sort of leaving the orchestration to Airflow. So how does that look like? So instead of managing one heterogeneous workload Spark cluster, we use Airflow tasks to launch a tiny Spark cluster on demand for each DAG or for each uh, task in a DAG. So we leverage Spark's integration with Kubernetes and we leverage Airflow's integration with Kubernetes to do that. So Airflow's sort of KPO task launches a Spark driver pod. The Spark driver pod launches its executor pods and the executor pods are doing the partitioning and sort of processing of the data. Whereas we, the only thing which the KPU is kind of trying to do is orchestrating the driver. So the driver is the one talking to Airflow and executor, whereas the driver, so the KPU is only talking to the driver. The executors are sort of like unaware of all of this communication. And the way they talk to each other is parked using KDAS APIs to like sort of manage that. So what are the advantages of this? It kind of allows us to be independent. You're only using Airflow as an orchestrator, which at least until 2.9 has been our experience that third-party integrations are sort of not as stable as we would want them to be. And Airflow is only very, very good as an orchestrator. It also provides us flexibility. So you can have these executor pods once you well, once you've figured out how to uh, set up your Spark cluster, which is an initial sort of setup time, you can really let that be a black box for your developers and just have them write Spark executor scripts. And that kind of is also helpful for data science workflows as well. So we can totally see this being super flexible and we have in our experience. And again, like because of its independence of uh, ownership, Spark does the heavy lifting of scaling and managing the cluster. Um, there are some disadvantages, but like as anything, there are trade-offs and for our workflow, we're kind of okay with these. There's an initial setup cost. You need to figure out how to build that Spark cluster out. There is uh, definitely a tiny bit more involved troubleshooting. You need to look at every Spark application and its entirety. Sort of every new application requires a new UI to check and tune. And then DAG writing for high performance workflows becomes an, uh, sort of a, a thing in its own self. You need to be good at Spark, you need to be good at Airflow good at sort of underlying infrastructure and knowing what about it, knowing about it. But then once you know that, you can really sort of push it far. And I think I wanted to highlight this as well. What's the difference between these three paradigms? What's the difference between our operator, the Kubernetes Spark operator, and the Spark operator which Airflow provides? So the two on the right are already provided by Airflow, but the one on the left is the one we wrote. There's a difference here. You can either have a standalone Spark cluster, which, is, which you really need to like spend some time tuning for heterogeneous workloads, and then you have Spark submit jobs to that cluster. But then that's not what we wanted to do. We didn't want to manage one cluster because it's kind of hard to tune performance for different kinds of workloads. If you're like generative ASR workflows are very different in terms of resourcing as opposed to debt summarization. And that's something we didn't want to do. So the middle one kind of goes out the window. The second, the one, the rightmost is a Spark operator which Airflow provides where you're able to sort of spin up an, a Spark cluster on demand using Airflow native operators. But the problem is that they use the underlying KTS CRD systems to spin up Spark. And that is a KTS native view rather than a Spark native view. You can't really do a lot of power using of Spark if you're really good at that. Things like executor-specific pod templates, things like how do you have the memory overhead fractions or sort of compaction overheads be really low in certain use cases and really high in other use cases. And frankly, we felt that it was not as flexible. And you can think of it, it's like two levels of indirection over Spark. So that's sort of not something. So what we provide is a Spark native sort of scheduling uh, framework, which uses Spark scheduler rather than the KDS scheduler to interact with the underlying infra. And in our sort of use cases, which we've seen super, super flexible for our use cases. So now once sort of that is built, how does that look like? That looks that every single task launches its own Spark cluster and then sort of interacts with S3, interacts with your data, and then dumps it to a place where other tasks know this. And this then becomes like a newer version of a task, if you may. What are the results for this? 
we saw an order of magnitude improvement in runtime durations for specifically ASR historical audio sampling workflows. Earlier, it used to take about 43 hours for multiple thousands of hours of audio. And we are now down to less than five hours. And this is without optimizations in sort of Spark for the kind of data we're needing. This is just like very simple optimizations, uh, which are not sort of workflow specific, but more generic. And with this, we're able to sort of also explore like Pareto sort of improvements in how we scale workflows and what is the optimal path configuration. One last throw aside, I think I, I am running out of time here, but similar workflows can be used for LLMs where you can think of the task pod calling an LLM using an API, but at the same time, if you have, if you're hosting like really efficient LLM inference servers like DLLM, TGI, and NVIDIA Tensor RD, every executor can have a baked in sidecar image or can spin up a specific LLM as a dart script. And those can be specifically scheduled on GPUs using pod templates for Spark executors. And this kind of, again, makes it super scalable. You can, it's also a black box and it's a template which people can use and run their own custom models. One last slide, key learnings. Again, Airflow doesn't stand alone. Spark is here, the ML platform. And we have deep infrastructure and Airflow integration using KDA, Spark, and Airflow. Again, like doubling down, Airflow is really strong as an orchestrator. And we've seen, again, great stability and improvement after 2.3. We're currently on 2.9 and are super excited about 3. Yeah, I think I'm out of time. 